On May 15, 1956, an RCAF transport plane takes off in the Canadian Arctic, bound for Montreal. A flight plan has been filed, but it never reaches Air Defense Command, in charge of protecting northern skies against the threat of Soviet invasion. It will end in disaster. Tuesday, May 15th, 1956. 11 kilometers east of Ottawa, in the tiny village of Orleans, Ontario, it is just another day. The largest building in Orleans is the Villa Saint-Louis, near the banks of the Ottawa River. It serves as a retreat and rest home for the Sisters of Charity, an order commonly known as the Grey Nuns. Uh, the Villa Saint Louis was a beautiful building. It was facing the river. Uh, nuns that were had been sick or operated or something like that, they went there to rest. It was close from the river. And every week, the uh, nuns came down for, say, for our holidays. The Villa's resident chaplain is 43-year-old Father Richard Ward. Since his arrival, he has struck a chord not only with the sisters of the convent, but with their neighbors, particularly the Potvan family. That priest was a special man. Nearly once a week, he stopped at the farm. At that time, my dad was managing the farm, put it right under the cross. The Potvans all live in homes on the Saint Louis farm. Today, Joe Potvan and his children are on their way to fish in the river when they meet one of the nuns from the villa. The sister seems unusually nervous. She told me, Joe, it's funny. I feel funny today. But she took my hand and said, Joe, don't go to the river. You go back home. My oldest son, Daniel, said, Dad, we're going to fish. We're going to fish. Then I mind the nuns. <laughs> Many of the convent residents are elderly, and some are recuperating from surgery. Others are quite young, just beginning their lifelong service to God. Sister Andre Bernard is just 22 and has yet to pronounce her perpetual vows. She works at the infirmary at the Order's Mother House in Ottawa with Sister Erne. Oh yes, I knew most of them because uh, uh, we had four of the younger ones there that uh, were helping us during the summer. And uh, those younger ones had gone for their holidays in uh, New Orleans. Sister Ernay's aunt, Sister Saint Croix, is also spending holiday time at the villa. She is joined by 27-year-old Sister Matai de la Croix, who has just returned from service in New England. Sister Laura Barbeau is a student nurse at Ottawa General, owned and operated by the Grey Nuns. She is looking forward to spending time at the Villa Saint-Louis. We had uh, three months of classes and then three months on, on duty. And uh, we were scheduled uh, to leave that evening for uh, our uh, two-week vacation at the villa. At the last minute, however, the trip is postponed until the following morning. Uh, the rector of the uh, La Salle Academy came and uh, asked our superior uh, of the time if uh, we would like to um, have the, the young men from the uh, academy come to give us a play at the hospital. And as we were going on vacation anyway, well, we said yes. For Laura Barbeau, it will be one of the most important decisions of her life. Tuesday, May 15th, 1956, 9.30 p.m. 
a four-engine RCAF North Star approaches Montreal. It has been filing position reports every half hour since leaving the Canadian Arctic earlier in the afternoon. None of these reports have reached the 445th Squadron monitoring the skies from CFB uplands near Ottawa. The spread of communism in the decades since World War II has been seen as a real threat to Western nations, Canada included. Like squadrons across the country, the 445th is on 24-hour alert, with two of its new CF-100 fighters ready to take off at a moment's notice. The CF-100 was the first fighter built in Canada and designed by Canada. The CF-100 was uh, uh, air defense interceptor to protect against the, the threat of uh, Soviet bombers coming across the north. At 9.30 p.m., CFB Uplands detects the North Star transport on its radar. Unaware of its flight plan, ground control cannot identify the aircraft and immediately orders its two standby CF-100s into action. Firstly, we'd have to identify it if we thought it necessary. If it wasn't necessary, it was our job to shoot it down. One of the fighters is piloted by 25-year-old flying officer Bill Schmidt. 20-year-old Ken Thomas is his navigator. Ken Thomas, he was what people would like to think of as typical boy next door. A really, really nice kid. Um, he was engaged to be married within a couple of months. Within minutes, the two RCF fighters intercept the unidentified aircraft. Ground control is relieved when it turns out to be one of their own. One of the CF-100s returns to base. Bill Schmidt and Ken Thomas report that they have excess fuel, which they need to burn off before landing. It is the last transmission they will ever send. It's always better to burn off some fuel before you land. It makes the landing much easier when you don't have a full load of fuel on board. It seemed routine initially, and then the, the radar ground-controlled uh, PCI operator lost radio contact with them. There was no warning calls or any indication that there was any aircraft malfunction prior to that, the aircraft disappearing off the radars. It is 10.15 p.m. Like most of the residents of the Villa Saint Louis, Sister Louis Auguste is in bed. She is a former mother superior who has been convalescing at the convent for the last eight months. Father Richard Ward is still up. He hears an unusual sound outside that he recognizes as the whine of an aircraft approaching very quickly. Traveling at over 1,100 kilometers per hour, the CF-100 rams through the chapel adjoining the convent, then slams into the main building. There is only an instant between the initial crash and the horrible explosion that envelops the villa. In that instant, Father Richard Ward calls out to the sisters, trying to warn them. The shock of the explosion is felt all over Orleans. All of a sudden, there was one hell of a bang. Everything in the kitchen, the glasswork, that all broke the house. That's how you step with you. And I heard the noise and went to the window to look at the flames. We thought it crashed in the field. We didn't know. We were looking at the fire and we were hearing people yelling. We thought it was in the forest. You could see from the farm, my house, maybe a mile from my house. It was red all over. By a cruel stroke of fate, the aircraft hits the only building of any size in the small community. 
Around it are open fields and forest. Now, that building is a blazing inferno, and its residents are still inside, some too old or too sick to escape on their own. Tuesday, May 15th, 1956. Just after 10.15 p.m., a CF-100 fighter jet on a routine mission smashes into the Villa Saint Louis, a retreat for the Order of Grey Nuns. Inside the building, Sister Louis Auguste's world erupts around her. At first, I thought it was a bomb. I think everyone on the top floor must have been burned. Many on the ground floor were also unable to get out. I just had time to run to the aid of some of my companions, some of whom were invalids. Held by another sister, I transported one of the invalid sisters to the exit. Blinded by the thick smoke, the nuns can only feel their way along the walls, searching for escape. Some of them were not well and uh, probably had taken medication also before they went to bed. Uh, so the others went to try to wake them up. Outside, neighbors hurry to the villa to help. Rayal Rainville and his brother-in-law, Lawrence Barber, are among the first to arrive. There was no fire escape or nothing like that. So we tried the back door, and uh, there's no way. It was locked solid. So that's when somebody got on uh, uh, Lawrence Barber's uh, shoulders, and he, he managed to break the window, went in and opened the door for us. The men begin pulling terrified nuns from the building. One of them is Sister Saint Croix. My aunt, she had tried to uh, take the corridor, but when she opened the door, she burnt her hand on the doorknob, and then she went to the window but there was a screen. She couldn't get out by herself, so the men just got one on top of the other and put her out. She had burn on her hand, on her arm, and her face. But besides that, she was okay. Some of them were heard banging on the doors upstairs. The door upstairs must have been locked. And we could hear them scream, something awful. One of those calling for help is Sister Marie de Martyr, trapped near her third floor window. I kept yelling, break the screen, break the screen. And uh, she finally broke, it fell down. She put her feet out of the window and she was sit uh, sitting like on the ledge and then she let herself go. Sister Louis Auguste has managed to escape the burning building. Although seriously injured, she is still more fortunate than those left inside. We saw some nuns falling inside. They didn't want to get out by the window. There were lots of people who were saying, we are going to catch you, but they didn't want to jump by the window. When I went to the front to try and get into the door, it was our only chance. It was impossible uh, anymore in the back and uh, the fire was coming out of the front real bad. And that's when I, I saw Father Ward like about 150 feet uh, in front of the building on his stomach. I thought it was one of the pilots of Bird. Several men answer Rayal's cries for help, including Wilfred and Joe Potvan. We brought him near the river and he passed away maybe two minutes after. I looked, I took him, he died in my arm. You always think that you, you can go into another door or something like that to try and get the, the rest of them out. And when you know that you can't do anything anymore, that's what hurt. The men have rescued 25 of the 37 people in the building. Most of the survivors are in nightgowns and bare feet. 
When police and firefighters arrive on the scene of the CF-100 crash, there is little they can do but stand with the growing crowd of onlookers and watch the building burn. There was a big field there and a big crowd. It was terrible. They were exclaiming, ah, because the fire was so high, so high, and it was so big. Among them are the Simards, sisters of one of the nuns, Matai de Lacroix. They cried a lot. They were saying, I hope my sister is not in the fire. I hope my sister is not in the fire. But unfortunately, she was there. The body of the 27-year-old nun is found in a rocking chair in her room, still holding her rosary in her hands. Some survivors are taken to Ottawa General, owned and operated by the Grey Nun Order. Student nurse Laura Barbeau, who was supposed to be at the villa that night, is part of the emergency team. Well, they were brought uh, in cars and in ambulances, and uh, those who came here, of course, were those who needed some type of medical help. Uh, this was a very, very uh, emotional moment for us because uh, many of our sisters uh, were severely hurt. We uh, placed them in the rooms and uh, cared for them, uh, but those burns, they were very long. It took very long to heal. They needed dressings every day. Sister Erne is also concerned about the fate of the younger nuns who worked with her at the infirmary and who were staying at the Villa Saint-Louis. We were so anxious to know if they would be back. And we learned through the night that uh, they, they, they were in the fire. They died. One of them, Sister Andre Bernard, never gets the chance to take her final vows. Those without physical injuries are taken to a farmhouse not far from Orleans, where Sister Eliane Lalonde lives with eight other nuns. A car arrived crowded with nuns, and one of them came in the house screaming. They were all in terrible, terrible shock. I don't think we went to bed that night. <laughs> uh, you know, even after everybody was settled in, we just uh, spent the rest of the nights talking about it and um, wondering how this could all happen. How this plane happened to fall on the building was beyond our understanding because uh, it was so close to the river and there was so much space around there. Uh, that it was really unbelievable. The next day, the death toll is confirmed. 15 are dead. 11 nuns, the priest father Richard Ward, 40-year-old housekeeper Aline Lapointe, and the two crewmen. A few days after, when they dig uh, to find something with the airplane, I saw the wallet of the pilot, and he had his son's picture, and I saw his picture. I forget this. An inquest attributes the explosion to the CF-100's substantial fuel supply at the time of the crash. The cause of the tragedy is never confirmed, but Air Force officials have a theory. We can only assume that both the crew members were incapacitated. The most logical reason for that would be an oxygen failure. Nothing else would go along with the, the scenario uh, with no radio communication indicating a problem uh, and uh, neither member, crew member getting out of the aircraft.
the ruins of the Villa Saint Louis are eventually cleared. A new building is constructed in its place, not a private convent, but a public nursing home run by the Grey Nuns. They've made a monument with the remaining pieces of the building, the cross, the brick, and it's still there in front of the building. They did that special monument for the victims of the accident. Those involved in the Villa St. Louis fire don't need monuments to keep the memory of the tragedy alive. You can still hear them screaming sometimes, you know, and you don't want to remember that. It, it, it's the kind of screaming that you're not going to hear, on, even on TV, you know. I don't, it's not the same thing at all. It was extremely tragic, but again, uh, in faith, you, you have to accept these things. Uh, there's a purpose for everything.